recording the, uh, the screen share, so any questions you ask will be on there and probably upload to YouTube later. Uh, so today we're going to talk about middleman static site generation, which is something that um, I've kind of played with for uh, a few years now. I built my blog in it and um, a podcast site and recently the Peer Lab site that I talked about on Stand Up this week. Um, and middleman is a static site generator, so it takes a bunch of um, dynamic files like uh, uh, ERB files or Slim or Haml or whatever and compiles them into HTML um, at, uh, at build time. And then you can serve that site statically from an S3 bucket or um, pages. GitHub pages, exactly. Um, and the question is like, why would you actually want to do that? Like, why bother? Uh, and, and the answer really is that you have like an unhackable backend because you have no backend. Uh, I mean, provided that your S3 bucket's secure, um, it's very unlikely that anyone's going to be able to like modify the contents of your site. Um, the downside to it is that you can't have any dynamic content like stuff loading from a database. You can, but you have to use JavaScript, which is like a pro or a con, depending on your... Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, a good example of that is the uh, Danger website. It statically cool. generates all of these like small micro pages, mm. and then with JavaScript pulls them in. Nice. And so it looks like it's, uh, it looks like it's doing it all magically cool. in the server, but it's not. Yes, okay. it's very similar to Jekyll. Okay. Jekyll, I think, is more blog focused. Middleman is like it has a blogging component, but you don't have to use it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you've got really easy CDN caching because everything is static, so you don't need to worry about. Um, I mean, unless you have some sort of dynamicism through JavaScript, you don't need to worry as much about like uh, invalidating specific things or not. Like. Um, I just throw Cloudflare in front of my entire uh, website and it just works. Um, deploys are really easy, uh, either through FTP or uh, S3 or whatever, and uh, it's very configurable. There's like a... Hey, how's it going? Yesterday, but you and I probably aren't on the same floor. Yeah. No, I worked from home yesterday. Oh, okay. Hey. <laughs> We're just talking about, or getting introdu uh, introduced to middleman. Um, it's a static site caching, uh, sorry, a static site generator like Jekyll. Um, the reason you might want to do that is because you have uh, no backend, which is advantageous. And CDN caching is really easy, deploys are really easy. And the really cool thing I like about Middleman, um, I don't know, versus Jekyll, uh, but like it has a very good community of like uh, plugins and people making projects uh, to support Middleman. Um, so uh, I can go through a few of them that I use on my site, which are pretty cool. Um, so I thought we'd go through a demo, because code talk. Um, so I've got a, a test directory here, and I've installed middleman. It's a Ruby gem, so it's just gem install middleman. And you say middleman in it. And this is going to ask you some questions about the site that you want to build, um, like uh, whether or not you want to use Compass or Rack. Um, wow, it usually doesn't take this long. I think the... Uh, I always overestimate the capabilities of this little computer. <laughs> um, there we go. So do you want to use Compass? Nah. No live reload. Uh, Rack compatible file? No. Um, the Rack compatible thing is in case you want to like mount it onto a Linux server. So oh, interesting. I wanted to say, like, if you have a Sinatra Rack, yep. just post this section of it inside uh -huh. This bracket, but also yeah. the thing that you need to deal with redirect, like where redirect. Um, sites that I keep trying to figure out what Gotcha. <laughs> so after you've answered the questions, you can type in middleman, and that is going to uh, run the server. So it's, it's weird because locally you're going to be running it as a server, so you can just modify something and then uh, reload your website or use hot uh, live reloading to uh, take a look at your changes. Uh, I'm going to open up the directory, do, 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 and we can take a look at the code while that's loading. Um, yeah, I, it is actually like quite a capable computer. Recording. Yeah, it's screen recording and it's screen sharing and everything, so <laughs> that's my excuse. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so we've got our site loaded. We can go to localhost 4567, and this is the scaffold that Middleman has created. It's just a single page with a logo and a link to the documentation, which is, I think, pretty 
pretty cute. Um, it's created a gem file for us with some basic dependencies, uh, which we can customize. Um, the config file is mostly commented out, but it specifies things like um, we don't want to use layouts for XML or JSON files. We want to serve those statically. Um, you can define your own custom helpers, which are Ruby functions or methods that um, you can call from your template files. And then you can have build specific configurations. So you can run regular uh, SAS or less or regular CSS when you're running it locally on your server. And when you compile it, when you build your um, assets, then you can minify your CSS and JavaScript only then. So that way you get the, uh, the uh, readability when you're running it locally, but the minification um, otherwise. Um, yeah. So the uh, index.html.erb, it's a ERB template, um, very small. Um, basically, you can have as many pages as you want. You have a corresponding ERB file. Um, and then uh, similarly, there's a, a layout that wraps all of your, by default, the layout wraps all of your pages. Um, can everyone read that code? Well, it's not too important to read, but there we go. Um, so by default, the layout wraps all of your pages, but you can specify per page layouts. Uh, some pages don't have to have layouts. Um, so that's pretty cool. And otherwise, you've got an images directory, a JavaScript directory, and a style sheets directory for those assets that you want to include. How do you deal with different layouts or different areas? Sure. So in the config file, this is where you specify um, a page with a specific layout. Um, I believe you can also specify the layout in the YAML front matter for that page. So if we look at the index.html, it has the title here. We could also specify layout and then give it the layout name. Yeah, 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 super handy. So uh, that's a very basic uh, website. I want to take you through a little bit of a more complicated one. Um, so let's go to the Pure Lab website that uh, that I built uh, over the weekend. This took um, about a day. I uh, started at a Pure Lab, which was pretty cool. Um, and I've got a blog post up about uh, the process I went through to actually make it. Um, the very first thing I did after I got middleman working was to get deploys working, and which we'll talk about shortly. And um, right after that, automated deploys from continuous integration because um, because Orta told me that it's really important, and I listened to him one time, and it turns out he was right. We got a lot of PRs in the first day, so to have deployed like seven or eight times would have been a lot of hassle. Yeah, exactly. So this is the website that uh, is built with middleman, served up uh, dynamically now, um, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, the deploys, um, if we look in the code, open, I think it's, yep. Yeah. So I just used a gem called middleman gh pages, which deploys to GitHub pages. The way it does that is um, pretty, like almost embarrassingly simple. We use the same deploy on Artsy's developer blog where we just go into the directory, pull down the changes from the same repository, but on the GitHub pages branch, and then rebuild the site, commit the changes if there were any, and then push it back up to the site. So all I wanted to do was uh, automate that. I didn't want to have to write that over again. Um, so I installed the gem, and then in my rake file, all I had to do was uh, require that gem, and it added the tasks for me. I added the task to check and see if we're on Travis and make sure that we're on the master branch so we don't deploy. And then if that's true, then we uh, run the published task that the gem gives us. Uh, and that's automated deploys, um, which is pretty cool. So um, middleman server is the uh, command, or uh, middleman, which is short for middleman server, um, is the command that uh, runs the server locally. You can specify uh, all the configuration options that you want to, like the port number and stuff like that. Uh, middleman build, uh, which I can also run, what this is going to do is generate the pages for you and instead of serving them dynamically, it's going to store them in a specific directory. So this is what we do when we want to deploy. It's pretty handy because it'll let you know like when um, files are identical or versus like updated or created. Um, so if you want to be really granular about your CDN invalidation, you can say like 
well, the only files that have changed are like the index page, so better invalidate just that page. Um, there used to be, uh, uh, for Middleman version 3, there was a gem I used to do that for me, um, but they didn't update to Middleman 4 when I did, so I just invalidate everything now. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Mm. The, uh, the that's another really cool thing that's built into middleman is um, assets what is it called uh, good question yeah it, it takes it takes the well we can look in the documentation um, it takes the uh, hash of the file and puts it at the end of your CSS or JavaScript file name and then whenever the contents of the file change you don't need to worry about a CDN and validation because it's actually pointing to a different file name on the server um, Assets, uniquely named asha, uh, asset hashing and CDN yeah. configuration. So it's pretty cool that that kind of stuff is like built in. Yeah, sure. Sure. So uh, we specify the language and RVM version. We want a cache bundler. Um, this is to set up uh, automated deploys. So we echo a personal access token from GitHub to the netrc file, and then give it uh, the accurate permissions, and then set up git configuration so that um, when uh, middleman goes to commit the changes to the build directory, it has a git identity to, to use for that commit. And then um, the netrc file is what authenticates the git push to GitHub so that it can um, actually make those changes. So any secure environment? So you're API keys and environment variable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is like kind of insecure. Um, I've also done it using the, um, you can get a, uh, uh, yeah. GitHub's private key, the repo. They have, they have deploying keys on GitHub pages? Yes, um, exactly. At least Apple uses that though. I use it on, on my personal blog with Travis, yeah. Yep. Uh, we run a, a rake test file, or rake test task, which just builds the site and makes sure there were no errors. And if there weren't any, then we uh, run the Travis task, which makes sure that it's running on master and, uh, and on CI and uh, pushes that up. And the whole thing, the process from like the CI starting to um, when it's finished takes under a minute uh, for this site. For my blog, it takes like four minutes, and it's like the worst four minutes in the world. <laughs> <laughs> You've just written a blog post, you want to see it on the web and tweet a link to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what makes my blog so uh, long, is because I have blog posts that like each page needs to be generated, and this website has three pages. Yeah, um, do, 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 do. so we already covered deploys. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to talk about was somewhat pseudo-dynamic data. Um, so if I look in uh, the PeerLab website, I'm just gonna go to it remotely. Um, we have a list of all of the Peer Labs around the world, which is pretty cool because we've got them from like a bunch of different countries and states and stuff. Um, Whitby, Ontario, which <laughs> I very much doubt anyone has heard of, but my friend, <laughs> my friend runs a peer lab there. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I wanted to make this as easy as possible to contribute to. Like the whole point of um, of the site is that uh, finding a peer lab is easy, starting a peer lab is easy, and part of that process is um, adding your peer lab to the list. So Middleman has a, uh, what's called a data directory, and uh, what you do is create a YAML or a JSON file in the directory, and then specify whatever data you want. So in this case, we've got a peer labs, uh, well, it's, it's a dictionary, so the peer labs key corresponds to an array, and each object in the array has a city, a schedule, a location. These are all just strings. And then <coughs> in the actual code, um, here it is what we can do is access this data variable and then the name of the YAML file. And um, so you say data dot and then the name of the YAML file and then whatever data you want to access in that YAML file. Um, and then like I'm sure that there's a better way to do this like 
uh, template file, but um, like I said, it was kind of a, a day long thing. I didn't want to spend too much time in it. Like mustache templates would probably be what I want to use, right? Well, yeah, yeah, you'd find it. It would be, it'd be hard to follow the mustache. Yeah, exactly. With what? Mustache and mustache? Does it support Yeah, it supports a bunch of them. Yeah, let's uh, template. You could just add a helper for some of those big complicated That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, One of the advantages of, of this is that it's running on your computer, so you can do it from OCC if you want. So the, Jekyll tries to make sure everything's like tight. Mm -hmm. So for like you can specify your own Markdown engine and uh, Markdown engine configuration like fence code blocks or uh, Smarty Pants options. Um, uh, do, 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 do. These are all of the files it supports. So it even does like CoffeeScript and uh, Less and SAS. So it's not just uh, for pages. It's a um, bunch of really cool stuff. This stuff is really interesting. Using a gem called Tilt, which is like a rack book for uh, template languages. So it says as long as you have this, you know, an output of like functions, mm -hmm. then and then you can conform to the Tilt standard. So uh, all nice. of them conform to a Tilt standard. So Jekyll has the same. I use it in my own like, uh, code. That's so cool. Yeah. 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 Um. So uh, right. So I've got this code written out once, and instead of someone having to like modify an ERB file in order to add their peer lab to the site, all they do is um, specify uh, this information, and it gets generated. And uh, also, really important is that I documented that in the README so that I don't have to answer questions. And so far, no one's asked, how do I add my peer lab? So let's hear it for documentation. Um, yeah, um, so that's it's a PR, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I even I link to the individual file, and then GitHub has the built-in editor. So yeah, exactly. Um, I'm really glad I added the um, the test as well because some people added tabs instead of spaces, and broke uh, the YAML formatting. So um, oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. Our change log is in YAML on, on Eigen, so I um, want to make sure it stays valid. Um, that's pretty much uh, everything. I mean, there are some more complicated things uh, that you can do. Um, like if I open up my blog. Yeah, exactly. So search was, was kind of crazy for me because it wasn't... Um, it wasn't uh, YAML, or sorry, it wasn't middleman as much as it was just like figuring out JavaScripts, which um, I've since like done a lot more of, but at the time I hadn't done JavaScript since like 2004. So JavaScript's changed a bunch. Um, <laughs> it's true, yeah, a little bit. Um, but uh, there is a, hold on. There is a middleman search gem that I installed, which wraps uh, Lunar JS under the hood, and then in my um, what Lunar. Lunar, which I think is a plan solo. Yeah, oh. that's right. <laughs> um, I guess for the implementation. Exactly. So uh, if the like in I just put it in my like all dot JavaScript because I don't care about page size, I guess. Sorry. Um, so if the URL matches search, then it downloads the search.json file, which is the actual index of all of my blog posts and stuff that gets generated when middleman builds. Um, and then it uh, sets up the necessary, um, I'm just going to call it um, jQuery stuff. <laughs> like, so it loads the lunar index and then um, does some weird stuff to the DOM and uh, binds the key up to a function that uh, calls the um, uh, lunar engine with the uh, 
search query. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So then um, <coughs> I'm really proud of this because when you first download it, there's this little spinner indicator on the right hand side that's like tells you that it's downloading the cache and then when you actually like um, type in uh, stuff then it's, it's a search as you type um, implementation. Um, you don't have any summaries now, right? That no. I, the, the one exists doesn't exist, it just say no. So the uh, solar, sorry, the lunar index indexes the terms of the blog post, but if I were to actually include the summary of the blog post, the index is already like two megabytes large, which is pretty big. That's why I have the little spinner to indicate that it's downloaded. Um, Wait, so I saw, what do you mean by terms then, I guess? So how did the word exist find just say no? Uh, let's check it out. Um, yeah, so the um, when I build the middleman site, part of the build process from the middleman search gem generates the uh, lunar index, which looks through the contents of the middle, uh, the markdown files in order to build up that search index, which I don't understand the data structure behind that, but um, and it must have grabbed the fact that this blog post has that in it. So I've taken a look at the uh, lunar index just briefly, and it's basically uh, two hashes. One of them is a bunch of terms, and the other one is a bunch of pages that mat that contain those terms. Does anyone else know? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Search engines, they just build like a reverse index on the terms they find in their content mm. and map it back to wherever it's found. So, like, if it builds that in JF, it's where you go. Yeah. Right yeah, exactly. I think it builds the index in Ruby and then searches the index in JavaScript. So, it's this weird, like, that's the thing with, with the static site is that um, there's this real, uh, like, differentiation between what you can do at build time versus. Uh, render time, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so sometimes you have to like, like I helped out, uh, one of my first CocoaPods pull requests was to add um, fetching from a JavaScript, the, the GitHub API, um, once you render this, the page. But we needed data from the build time configuration. So there was this like really weird process of marshalling. Like <coughs> I have this variable in Ruby, and I need to store it somewhere when I build my site so that JavaScript can access it when it's rendered. And like that sort of um, com like complication isn't something that I think you have to deal with as much on like a dynamic server page. Right, unless it's server side JavaScript that renders on server side. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how that prediction works. works. <laughs> right. What language? It doesn't sound very middleman <laughs> Right, exactly. Getting out of that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty cool site. Um, well, my blog. Um, I hate <laughs> to. Great. Yeah, no, it totally is. Because um, there's uh, like one thing you can do is um, I think I built this. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, uh, five years of iOS. Um, so this is like mostly just some JavaScript, and um, when if we look at the actual uh, source, um, I think it's HTML.slim. Yeah. So um, oh, I didn't have anything to. So the JavaScript for this is also downloaded on every page. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, but if we scroll all the way to the bottom, there's this like link to one of my books, so that someone will buy it hopefully, um, and. In order to do that, I have a link to, and then the book that I want to link to. So I just have that in my YAML front matter, and then when I generate the pages, the template looks for that and links to either this post or one of my other ones. Um, so there's like some really cool stuff you can do, um, like abstractions that you can build. Yeah. Anyone have any other questions about middleman or static site generation? I'll give you a good anecdote. Um, so there's one interesting problem about having a non-dynamic 
uh, website is that what if you have content that's outside of your control that you want to have update? Uh, so a great example of this is Dangerous Plugin System. Um, uh, I would like anybody to be able to create a plugin, but I would also like anybody to be able to say it's time to update the Danger website because my plugin is going to update it. So part of what I uh, what we have is a like a Heroku uh, app that exists entirely to get received by hooks from GitHub repos that then triggers the same build process um, that uh, we use at the end of a CI run to, to start a new uh, version of the website um, that allows us to have this kind of, it's dynamic whenever we need it, and it's only a very small subset of the website, so it's all very, like, it's all completely simple. It just happens to be triggered by external uh, services to create a new version of the website instead of just staying as is until someone sends a new PR. Mm -hmm. or a new commit happens on it. Can How do you get that list of plugins that are during the build process? So during the build process, so yeah, go to the repo. Um, down, uh, so the repo is danger.systems. Danger.systems has a JSON file that is just like a list of the gems that everyone uses um, as plugins. I think it should be plugins of JSON at the bottom. And a yeah, there you go. Um, and this just looks like this. So when you want to add a new plugin to Dangers, like on page, that you just make a PR to that. What that does behind the scenes is if you go back again and do search, uh, search generated. So Danger then derives. Uh, if you hit raw, you might be able to read that better. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of. Um, so at local time, it will uh, do a, a Ruby Gems API lookup for every single uh, gem that has been passed in there. And then we'll generate a list of like, what's its URLs, its summaries, and things like that. So then they can use. Yeah, John. <laughs> <laughs> so with that data, we can provide both search inside the, inside the web page, but we can also use that as an authentication key. So if, if we receive a webhook from any of the URL the web the URLs in here, then we then we can assume that that's a safe one and that it's gonna be something that has come in from uh, a plugin that we've already decided beforehand is good. Cool. So you submit the first JSON, that generates this JSON and we use this JSON as authentication for the system. Okay, so I'm missing one part. How does it get webhooked? I don't think I set up a webhook. No, you don't have to. Like it's an optional thing. As a as if part I, of data by hand systems, then I would get it yeah. I would force an update on your side. Exactly, you would force an update whenever you release a gem. Gotcha. So whenever there's a new tag, it triggers it. Um, there's a thing, in, just to read me actually, at the root, with a little, uh, oh yeah, it's we've moved off GitHub. So if you click on the GitLab link, the bottom one, uh, the readme in here will actually tell you how to, how to hook it up. Um, so it's there, it just says if you add this webhook, um, mm. then that's everything you need um, to auto-update whenever. That's pretty cool. Yeah. GitHub web webhooks are like so cool. Yeah, they're really cool. I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of that like structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like we're, we're putting all our time to like rabbit MQ and mm -hmm. these other things for our internal stuff. But like, but for web, but web hooks are like a perfect for external stuff. Um, a good example is like CocoaPods. If whenever anybody submits a new CocoaPod, you can opt in to get a web hook on uh, on new pods or updated pods or anything like that, so that you can build your own search index instead of just having your own. We use sorry, you to good luck finding. Oh yeah, yeah. Huh? Where'd you move to get lab. Yeah. Um, Danger supports GitLab as like a first class citizen uh, in terms of like sending messages and doing like introspective oh, merge right. requests. So the fact that I have zero GitLab uh, repos means that realistically I should have more of the org. So you understand it. Plus, GitLab pages are a little bit better than GitLab pages because you can do HTTPS with them. Oh, super cool. Yeah, as well as um, being able to. The process of building it is actually built into GitLab CI. So instead of you having a Travis, mm -hmm. you wouldn't need it at all in GitLab. It That's would just be a cool. default thing. It would, it would actually be a default thing, I think, entirely for your bit of that Nice. So no need to put your GitLab token in there because it already is GitLab. That's really cool. And it would just do it.
One more plug for webhooks too. Um, I built this thing called uh, Aaron, which automates GitHub invitations to uh, join organizations. <coughs> so basically, on uh, next, on Moya and a few other projects I run, whenever a pull request is merged, whether I merged or not, the webhook gets run, and then this uh, text gets uh, commented on, or this comment is applied to the pull request, and the person is invited to join uh, the GitHub organization. Um, and that's all built like in a very small, yeah, I think so. Um, it runs on like a Heroku dyno. I've never paid for it. Um, so like, I don't know, like this was my first exposure with webhooks and I was blown away. And now everyone thinks that I'm like hovering over the, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, sometimes the dyno has to wake up and it's like five seconds later, but, uh, we set it up so that it's like one button and then someone fills out a few questions on Heroku and then it's working. So anyone can uh, adopt the same sort of like auto inviting people to, so like yeah, uh, it's, uh, what is it? Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with middleman, but webhooks are cool. Did you talk about middleman data? Yeah, yeah, we talked about middleman data when I generated um, this uh, list of, oh, right, I closed that. This list of um, peer labs around the world are all generated from a YAML file. Oh, cool. Very cool. That used to be middleman, now it's check old, but same. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, very cool. Nice. Makes contributing easy. That's exactly why I did it too. Um, even like on my. Um, it makes it layout agnostic too. Yeah, it's so really cool. nice. Yeah. So my blog has. Um, so the five years post was actually generated from a YAML file um, based on uh, years and then headings and, and everything. Um, but I use something else for my um, the talks that are upcoming and past talks with links to the videos and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty, uh, I'm gonna stop the screen recording. Thanks a lot for uh, for coming, everyone. Uh, if you have any other questions, just ping me on Slack or.